Hey, welcome back. Look, if you're anything like me, you want every week of training to be better than the week before. More miles, longer run, more intervals, faster paces. Whatever you're measuring, you just want it to be better than the week before. That is until you reach that ideal training week at which you then hypothesize that holding that ideal week will lead you exactly to where you need to be by race day. Then you get about one week of that ideal training in before it hits the proverbial fan. Life, energy, niggles, all get in the way and it all kind of crumbles in a heat. Well, lucky for you, I'm about to show you how the initial study that set off this whole doing more to get better ideology has been misinterpreted. And the idea or concept of progressive loading is doing anything but progressing your running and what science says you should do instead. Because I know when I stopped focusing on trying to do more each and every week and took a more science-backed approach, I noticed a massive quality improvement in all of my training and more importantly, the enjoyment of my training because I wasn't so tired all of the time and fighting motivation. While you may not have heard the term progressive loading, I'm sure you're aware of the concept and you've seen a version of this graph. Progressive loading is just what we instinctively try to do as runners, more. But I am yet to see a runner's graph that looks as clean as this one. See, this principle of progression is mostly taken from strength training, which states that you need to increase resistance, intensity, and duration in order to enhance adaptation. And while this is very much true in strength training because of the neuromuscular recruitment relationship, and running is kind of a different story. And what I've seen is it's all based on this one research paper from 1981 by R.C. Hickson and his colleagues. So in Hickson's 1981 paper, time course of adaptive responses of aerobic power and heart rate to training, they took nine recreational runners and trained them six days a week for nine weeks. And they concluded, our results show that unless the training stimulus is increased, a high intensity daily exercise program does not result in further increases in VO2 max or further decreases in blood lactate or heart rate response to submaximal training after three weeks. So essentially bump up the training or fail to improve. However, I'm going to add context to Hickson's concluding statement by showing you what he actually found and how you can implement his true findings into your training. So the first biggest misinterpretation of Hickson's study was that he did not increase the intensity, frequency, or duration of any of his training sessions. What Hickson did after that initial four weeks, which was exactly the same week on week for each participant, was he increased the workload of the intervals and continuous runs so that the relative intensity as a percentage of VO2 max was the same for the remaining five weeks. So as an example, if you were to run a threshold session and you ran at your threshold 100%, which was a seven minute mile, after four weeks, you got slightly fitter and your threshold lowered. Now, in order to complete that same session at 100% of your threshold, you'd need to increase the workload a little bit. So instead of running a seven minute mile, you run a 655 minute mile. However, there's no actual progression in terms of the intensity, the duration, or the frequency of your training. Now, there are many caveats to the study, but the point that I'm trying to make is that the idea of progression in terms of building week on week is not what the study found. And that if you're trying to add two miles to your long run every week, an extra minute to an interval session, you're probably putting yourself at more risk of overtraining and injury than if you implement Hickson's true findings, which I'll run through and break down for you now. My method works on what I believe to be a more accurate interpretation of Hickson's 1981 study and is based off of the science of stress, adaptation, supercompensation, and mitochondrial development as well as routine, which when lacking, can completely ruin consistency for working professionals and parents who need to be planning ahead to fit their runs into their busy schedule. My system is based off of something I call cumulative load. After I introduce cumulative load, I'll show you how you can implement it into your plan along with the progression from Hickson's study. Cumulative load refers to the total amount of stress applied on the body across a prolonged period of time, not just Monday to Friday. According to the General Adaptation Syndrome model, 
When stressed, the body goes through a state of shock, adaptation, and exhaustion. Cumulative load attempts to keep the body in the adaptation phase, where it can become gradually stronger and more efficient without needing to push through into exhaustion, which typically happens when we try to progress or ramp up our training every seven days. From my experience, a runner's life typically will push them into the exhaustion phase without needing to augment the process through additional training week on week. Because when we're thinking about the fundamentals of endurance training, it really comes down to enhancing mitochondrial density. Within the mitochondria, we can utilize fat and oxygen to generate ATP, which is the energy currency of the cell that we use for our muscular contractions. The more mitochondria we have, the more dense it is, the more efficient it is, the more fat and oxygen we can utilize to generate more ATP, which means a higher force output, and that correlates to faster running for the same or less effort. And in this sense, cumulative consistent load is going to be more effective stimulus than sporadic high intensity high volume training followed by force rest which is what typically happens when we try to progressively and rapidly increase the volume and intensity and frequency of our training implementing cumulative load into your training is relatively straightforward step one is to build a week of training that you know you can 100 percent complete obviously it still needs to be somewhat challenging because otherwise we'll just put one run a week and be done with it it needs to be at a level where you know you can complete this training without being overly tired by the end of the week. And here's an example from one of my marathon base phase training plans. Step two is simply try to complete this week of training for four weeks in a row. Step three is the assessment phase. Were you able to complete all of your training over four weeks, bar like one or two missed sessions due to life, without getting overly tired? If you couldn't because of tiredness, niggles or injury, you need to maintain or reduce that training load and try again for another four week block. If you were able to complete the four weeks of training but you're feeling pretty tired, you can simply have a down week, around 70% of your training load or volume or whatever you measure before progressing into the next phase. Similarly, if you feel great at the end of the four weeks, you can progress into the next phase of training which is going to be your new progression into your next phase of cumulative load. Progression may be adding some zone three into your long run. It may be progressing from tempo intervals into threshold intervals. Whatever it is, it can't be too much, maybe 20% of your total training load. Then you just repeat steps one, two, three. Set out a week you know you can complete, go about completing it, reassess, and then apply progression. Adding progression every three or four weeks is exactly what Hickson outlines in his study and his conclusion. And it's something I believe Jack Daniels does really well in his training schedules. Because before applying progression, we need to adapt to the training we're doing right now. And adding more week on week does not allow us to do that. Applying a system of cumulative load over a few weeks allows us to build a routine around our training and our recovery before progressing to higher frequencies, intensities, or durations. And of course, when planning these phases of cumulative load, we need to understand our relative intensities. And that's where thresholds and training zones are super important, as I outlined in this video. And I have available a calculator and how-to guide in the description, which you can download for free, because there is more than one threshold that matters to endurance runners.